everybody. Welcome to Tapping the Wine Cellar. This week, we are discussing Chapter 10 of In Water and, and In Blood by Father Robert Schreider. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Father Keith. Thank you. Chapter 10 of In Water and In Blood uh, features the writings of, of uh, the Gospel of John and the three letters of John in the New Testament. And it really gives the book its name. Um, the Joannine writings are very unique in their own way. They're very different than the Synoptic Gospels. And John is writing uh, uh, later than all of them, probably. John is, um, spends a lot of time on Jesus from a completely different perspective. Jesus is always in control. Jesus is there before the universe began. And Jesus is, is always present to what's going on, always knows what's going on. The re references to blood in John's writings are, inca are relatively rare. However, they're important because they help connect us. Because you could read the Gospel of John with the impression that the spiritual life is superior to the physical life. And it's better to focus on one and not the other. And there were early Christians that did so. However, when Jesus, when Jesus talks in chapter 6 of John, he gives us the Eucharistic theology that we have today. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life within you. And that's, that's a key point for us as Catholics. The other thing is the from the first letter of John, where it is saying that uh, in Jesus comes in water and in blood, this is an obvious symbolism. In water is a symbol of baptism, and in blood is the crucifixion. And it helps orient John in such a way that the physical is as important as the spiritual, and what we do physically matters. And it's important for our physical selves to be where our spiritual selves want to go. And at this time, I would like to turn it to my friend, Vicki. Thanks, Keith. Um, as always, um, Bob challenges me in this chapter. Um, well, John's gospel has always challenged me in my readings and studies because sometimes I think John's gospel is so out there, it's hard to get your arms around the symbolism and everything in John's gospel unless you unpack it word by word. So I was grateful for Bob's unpacking of this, especially as it relates to precious blood spirituality, because for me as a companion, it really clarified some things for me. So there were sur surprises for me. I think the biggest, um, aha moment I had reading the gospel was Bob's connection with spirituality has to include concrete life. We, you know, we can't just uh, focus on, we're going to go to church and pray for people not to be hungry. We actually have to work so people are not hungry. So I really appreciated that because as someone who has spent most of their professional career in ministry, um, I know I've done it myself. Sometimes as ministers, sometimes as theologians, we get too much in our heads and we forget to connect the head and the action together. So the Bob's focus on that really, I was thought, what a good message, you know, that we have to have to include the concrete parts of life. The other, one of the others was the whole issue of hospitality. Now, when we think of hospitality, especially as we're getting ready for our holidays and for the Christmas and New Year's, we think of how are we kind to our guests? But he, again, surprises me and says, hospitality is how do we care for the stranger, the weary one? It's a, to care and nurture, to give them ease, so they can go back to where they're going from. Um, it, so it's not to look down on, it's not to um, discount the struggles a person is going through. 
It is to give them a break. And I, I like that uh, definition of hospitality. It really helped, again, recognizing that hospitality is so much a part of the charism of the missionaries of the precious blood. It was nice to get that better sense of what hospitality meant. And I'm going to save my next one for later. So Greg, what would you like to share? Thank you, Vicki. Um, when I first started reading this chapter in, in Water and in Blood, um, I was a little bit concerned because Bob had all of this talk about spirit and um, it seemed really heady and very overly theological. And I just remember kind of thinking to myself, well, gee, this is a nice mental exercise, Bob, but you know, how does this implicate for how we're supposed to live as people, as precious blood people? Um, but then he eventually kind of brings into kind of what Vicky talked about, the concrete, the concreteness of reality, our, our everyday life. Um, you know, we can't separate the two, spirit and, and the physicality of our, of our everyday life. The two have to go hand in hand. Um, at one point, Bob kind of talks about the way that we exalt the spirit is by lifting up the flesh. You know, that, that means helping people who are in poverty addressing issues of hunger, um, other kinds of injustices, uh, pro-life issues, and stuff like that. Uh, when we uplift the flesh, we also uplift the spirit. The um, other piece that kind of caught my attention, uh, Bob talks about it kind of in the later half of the chapter, is um, this notion of precious blood spirituality as offering kind of a rebirth for the church, a renewal for the church. Um, Bob goes on to say that the church needs to return to its sources and experience rebirth so as to remain faithful to its founder and to the gospel that it preaches. Um, so I, I just kind of found that to be kind of an interesting concept, especially just kind of seeing where we stand as a church today. Um, sometimes I wonder if it would be good for us to kind of step back and kind of go back to those sources and start asking ourselves the question, who are we in relationship to Jesus? Why is it that we're doing this? Um, you know, what does the gospel have to say to where we are today? How, what does it have to say to me? Um, you know, just start, really start to look inwards. And once we, once we get that reorientation inwards, hopefully that reflects itself in how we present ourselves to the world and how we reach out to the world. Um, so I will now pass it off to Newton. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and I really appreciate the question on how do we relate to these texts, especially to this idea of blood. And I was thinking about, to me, and this may sound transactional, although it doesn't really mean that, that there's a sense that there's a price for life. Now, this idea of the price for life, I think, is very mosaic in many ways, right? The idea of redeeming the firstborn. Um, and along with that is this very powerful statement from the Old Testament, the blood is the life. Uh, and I think of that really as being the cornerstone in terms of the way I, I appreciate the spirituality of the precious blood in the sense that, you know, it, it costs us something to be invested in the suffering of the world. It, it costs us something. It costs us financially, maybe on the most obvious level, but it costs us because we are changed by it or transformed by it. Uh, there's, there's a transition through this idea of sacrifice and blood to me, which really is at the heart of the gospel, the reality of what it means to come close to God. That, I think, the way I've described it sounds very much in line with what Bob Schreiter was writing in the tone in the beginning. It sounds very, perhaps, um, heady and theological. Uh, maybe it brings up um, poor theologies about atonement uh, that we wouldn't really buy into today. But I think about the really the cost of sustaining life itself, that today we live in a world where God is sustaining a lot of the world today, every day, and chooses to walk with us in pain and suffering, in joy and in sorrow. And 
it takes energy. It takes effort to do that. And therefore, there's a sense of the responsibility in response to that to also walk with others, to also participate in the sufferings of this world. That's what I really got from that question. I, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. I'm reminded of one of Gandhi's seven deadly sins, worship without sacrifice. Um, I think that this kind of reverberates with this, this idea that there is a cost to discipleship. There, we, we, it costs us something to believe. It costs us something to practice what we believe. It's not that easy. And in antiquity, many paid with their own lives for their faith. And even today, people are paying for their lives with their lives for their faith in different parts of the world. There were a couple of other quotes that struck me. One is uh, a quote from St. John Chrysostom, who said, if you do not see Christ in the beggar at the door, you will not find him in the chalice. And I think that's a very perceptive uh, soundbite in visualizing how we should look at life. And um, the other thing is, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer's cost of discipleship where he gives an extended reflection. Uh, for those of you that don't know Bonhoeffer, uh, he was a German Protestant theologian that lived in the 1930s and 40s, uh, ended up uh, becoming a resistor to Nazism and paid for his faith with his life just before World War II ended. The Nazis marked him as one who would not survive the war, so. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um Newton, you said a word that really struck me, um, transformation. And I think um, for me, that really is a great way to describe this chapter. Because if we really believe what the Eucharist offers us, if we really believe in the spirituality, we have to be transformed. Um, I wrote down a quote from the chapter, Bob writes, life freely given in love for the sake of a better future. Um, and that's always a challenge, I think, because how many times, again, and this chapter, I love toward the end, he said, that I forgot which quote it was, but he said, this kind of summarizes everything we've talked about in the whole book. When, um, it's the idea of, we have to walk with people, not walk over people. And I think that's sometimes the challenge in service. We think I'm going to um, pull you out of poverty, but not walk with you in the challenge. So I think that's for me, that transformative process. Yeah, and I also like that notion of um, kind of what you said about it's not just me pulling you out of poverty. Um, that doesn't exactly get at the solution of the problem. The solution to a lot of the problems that we're facing is, you know, we, we try and address them at a surface level, but we don't get to the root of them. When we choose to enter into solidarity with someone and accompany them, you know, we get to see that lived reality and what it looks like. And we get closer to what that core root of the problem is. Um, I mean, yeah, it's good to kind of, you know, put money into programs that support these people, but unless we figure out what the true root of the problem is, you know, it's just going to come up and, and manifest itself in other forms or, you know, you cut off one head and two more will take its place. Uh, you know, we really have to start getting at the root of these problems and we begin by, you know, entering into solidarity and accompaniment with other people. One of my professors at CTU, a colleague of uh, Father Bob Schreider for many years, uh, Claude Marie Babour. Claude Marie was a French Protestant missionary in South Africa, working with the Afrikaners, the, the uh, majority people who were being oppressed by the Boers. And uh, they were fine with her ministering with them as long as she lived in the white part of town. And yet, in the course of her ministry, she discerned that it was vitally important for her to live with the people she was ministering with. 
and chose to do so, even at danger, and suffered greatly because when the when uh, they found out where she was, they arrested her and threw her in prison, didn't even admit they had her for a while and abused her terribly. But she she paid a cost, but she was willing to. I mean, she chose to be with the people she ministered with for very important reasons. And it's something that ultimately we're called to do as well. And once again, it's a it's a cost of discipleship issue. Yeah, I think I think you're kind of onto something about you know, uh, Claudine, you know, living with the people that she served. I think one of the reasons why PBMR is so successful is because Father Dave and Father Denny they live right there in the neighborhood. They have a house right across the street from the center, so it's it's not like they leave that neighborhood and come here to Hyde Park where it's. You know, very wealthy and you know relatively safe. Uh, you know they're right there next to their neighbors who lost loved ones. Um, so I wonder if you know even going forward as a new creation, you know when we kind of look at what it means to minister on the margins, um, are we actually rooting ourselves in those margins or just you know going going to places to work and then returning to kind of our sanctuaries? You know, just a couple things to kind of put out there for thought. Um, I really liked what you said, Greg, because that really, to me, goes to that whole idea of renewal of the church. And that was, a, you had mentioned it earlier, and um, that was another part of this chapter that really jumped out at me because, has, again, as a companion, my understanding regarding the renewal of the church, I always thought was because of Gaspar's uh, ministerial history and so to see it connected to scripture really was kind of revel you know really a, a, a again an aha moment for me and I think that's one of the the challenge I think that's a challenge you you talk about um regarding our new creation coming together as one province how are we going to learn about what's going on in the community if we're not in the community but that's the same thing I think is the, pro the question with the institutional church today, because, you know, post pandemic, the big concern that people in parishes are talking about is how do we get people back to church? Because all of a sudden people have realized I can sit on the internet and I could get a good homily, I could get this, I could get that. How do we make church relevant again? Because we're not the same people we were two years ago. So how do we make the church relevant? This time of renewal is now. Absolutely. Absolutely, Vicki. Absolutely. And amen to Brother Greg. That was a fantastic insight. I agree with you completely. Um, it's, I think part of it is, is being who we say we are. That's the great challenge of being a Christian. We profess to follow a Savior that was crucified, that bled and died for us, who came to save the world and taught us how to live. Well, are we going to live it? And I think the problem why, with, uh, with people leaving the church and finding the church irrelevant is we haven't done that great a job of living what we believe. Uh, and, and when we're coming into a generation that is almost two and three generations removed from the American faith culture of the 1950s and 60s. Um, and, and those of us that are older are kind of have a problem with it. But young people are not only growing up um, unchurched, but un uh, unknowledgeable about church at all, have no idea what, what, have little idea what a faith life is and what it can offer them. And we're not going to do that just by putting out uh, wonderfully produced videos and such, although those are helpful. But it is going to be how we live with each other, how we accept each other, how we try to cross lines, and where we put our feet. And if we put our feet in a place and try to provide a sanctuary for others, uh, yeah, that's important. But where is that sanctuary is we it seems like some too often 
we insist that sanctuary be located in our comfort zone. And guess what? I don't think that's successful. I don't think that works. I mean, I think a lot of this also kind of calls us towards a kind of a renewed sense of communion. Um, you know, when we, when Bob talk, Bob's talked about several different times throughout the book, how, you know, blood is kind of seen as carrying the life force of a being. You know, when we receive communion at mass, you know, we're receiving the life of Christ within us, but it's also a deeper invitation to taking on, you know, his teachings. How do we incorporate that? You know, we can't, we enter into the work and the ministry that he, that he started, you know, when we talk about solidarity and, you know, combining both the spirit and the concrete together, you know, I think that also has to flow from, from that spirituality of communion, um, our own charism of the blood of Christ. You know, we, we become that which we receive. Uh, and in that sense, uh, you know, we, it, it calls on us to renew the way in which we, we live, uh, the way that Christ called us to be. It calls us to live a new way as a church. I think one of the challenges regarding Eucharist, though, is um, if we do not as uh, believers actively work on our faith, we often are relying on understanding of Eucharist that we got when, uh, you know, when we went to eighth grade catechism. And I think that's a challenge um, because as you sit in the pews and I'll be the first to admit it, there are times when going to communion is so routine that we don't think much about it. Um, I really liked when Bob said to receive the Eucharist is to commit oneself to the same things for which the Lord has died, the end of sin and the coming of God's justice. Um, I think if that line, if we all had to read that line before we entered in the, the communion line, I don't know that a lot of us would jump in that line as rapidly as we do on a typical Sunday. All right. I think that brings us to the end of our session today. We hope that this discussion of chapter 10 has been helpful as you work your way through Father Schreider's book. We encourage you to watch Father Keith's introduction of chapter 11, uh, which will come out on Friday, and then join us a week from now when we discuss chapter 11. Have a great week.